Hi everyone, I'm just going to introduce the research project that we'll be working on in legal research this term, which is responding to the problems of recidivist string drivers, which is a project of the Tasmanian Law Reform Institute. And what I'm going to do in this video is just briefly um, introduce this um, particular law reform issue, have a bit of a look at um, why it's a good one for us, give you a bit of a guide to reading the document, which is one of the first things you'll need to do, and then we'll talk about um, some of the issues around group formation and, the, and how we'll use groups here. Because I know as soon as you mention groups, people will immediately start recoiling about group work. But we've got some strategies here, I think, to hopefully make the group work as painless as possible on one hand. On the other hand, also to make it something that's hopefully really beneficial and hopefully something that you'll get a lot out of. All right, so let's start by restating very briefly the reasons why we're doing law reform in the legal research subject. Primarily, this is because it's one of the few areas that covers the entire spectrum of legal issues, um, and legal research issues, sources and, um, and concerns. So as far as pure legal research goes, it covers legislation. It covers the sources of legislation, the um, recordings in Hansard, the second reading speeches, everything else. It covers case law, it covers regulations. Um, it covers everything that everything that we need to look at. And there are not many areas of law where those things all come together. But it also covers the other areas of legal research that you might be less familiar with. And that's where we start looking at qualitative and quantitative data. We start looking at statistics. We start looking at the research on the efficacy of systems and how the legal system itself works. And that's something that I think you might be less familiar with, but I think you'll probably find interesting. And uh, law reform certainly provides us with an environment in which we can connect that to what we ordinarily call doctrinal legal research. It's also an environment that shows the way in which law operates in connection to other disciplines. So law doesn't operate in a vacuum by itself, um, in the way that sometimes it appears to do in, in the courtroom. Uh, in law reform, law has to have conversations with government, with policy, and in, particularly in this case with health. Uh, and we have to be able to understand how different disciplines see things, how they construct knowledge, how they conduct research, and so on. And finally, it's, um, it's good for us as, as professional citizens to be involved in law reform. Um, because if, no, if, if we don't fix the law, if we don't take responsibility for the law, who's going to? Uh, and we know no system's perfect and bits of it are broken. So, you know, we are uh, we need to take a leadership role in fixing it. So, OK, that's why law reform is a good t a good thing for researchers to look at. Why is this one in particular good? Well, the fundamental criteria that it came down to um, was that it's the only one that's active at the moment that has a closing date that is achievable. Um, for those of you who want to actually submit what you do to the um, to the inquiry, um, and that's pragmatically what we were left with at the end of the day. For some reason, this term, um, this particular time of the year, there has been a bit of a gap. Uh, there's a lot of um, law reform projects that are that have, are wrapping up that have finished, and that they're finishing the writing up of the final reports. There also seems to be a lot of um, inquiries that are at the uh, terms of reference stage where they're negotiating with the Attorney General as to what they're going to do and how they're going to do it and how they're going to be resourced. Um, this was the only one that fit into the, um, the, the perfect storm of time. There was another one on um, caveats in family law, which might have done it a pinch, but it, it, closed, it closes way too soon. And no disrespect to family law, um, this is a whole lot more interesting than caveats um, for myself and I suspect for a lot of you. And I'm fully prepared that there will be one or two of you who will tell me that caveats in family law is the most interesting and exciting thing that they're in their lives. And good for you if it is. Everyone has to be interested in something. But I do think a, sub, a topic like um, recidivism and drink driving is something that touches all of us. It's something we all have a, a starting opinion on. And it's something that, as we start digging into the issue, we're going to find out a lot more about the complexities of it. 
And that was another reason. So even though that it, that we were, this is the only one we could practically do, um, I think we're lucky because it's a really good one. There's a lot of meat on the bones. Um, sorry for, for vegetarians for that analogy. Um, a lot of a lot of tofu on the bones. Um, there, there, there's a lot of a, a, a lot to get your teeth into um, with this topic, and it's not one that's either too esoteric. And it's not one that has too obvious a solution um, because the, some of the aspects of this problem are very difficult. As I mentioned before, interdisciplinarity is something that's very important when we look at um, legal research. And this has the different ideas of responsibility that come out of the health professions and legal professions running head to head. And it's a very key part of what we're going to look at is, well, how do you determine someone who has an addiction problem? who has an addiction problem, how do we determine responsibility? And do we look backwards in terms of responsibility, in terms of you know punishing people for what they've done in the past? Or do we look forward in terms of trying to fix or cure this problem so these people won't be a danger to themselves and particularly to others in the future? So some very, very interesting um, questions that, that, that come out of, out, of, out of this inquiry. It also... Often students have difficulty in placing... Um, theory, particularly legal theory, within the practicality of legal work. And this is a very clear example where legal theory and practical work are very, very important. In particular, penology, which is theories of punishment. And what is it that the system does? And there are at least four different ideas at play um, when, we, when sentencing is performed as to what sentencing is and why it does. We talk about retribution, we talk about deterrence, we talk about um, incapacity. Uh, we talk about therapeutic jurisprudence. There's a whole series of different things that we talk about. So often when we say, is this person adequately punished for the crime they committed, we're talking about different things at the same time. Now, this is a great sort of sandbox in which we can actually start looking at the way in which theory works in practice and why theory is important, why theory isn't just something that... Um, is, is, is a hypothetical, abstract thing for philosophers. It's something that's actually a tool that, that we use in everyday research. It's a good project. That was my dog having a comment on this, but I don't know if you can hear that in the microphone, but there's, there's um, a lot of sighing going on in this room. Uh, I hope there's not sighing going on in your room as well. Um, all right, back to the project. Why is it good? Um... It, has, it also has comparative and international aspects, and that's also somewhere where you can really start looking at the way in which researchers need to look, not just at, well, what have we done in the past, what's worked and what hasn't, what's everyone else doing? What, what are the other success stories? How are they reported? What's currently going on in other jurisdictions and overseas? Again, very, very crucial part of this particular project, and really good for us because we actually get to see that sort of analysis and operation. And finally, for the why is this good um, part, um, it's a wicked problem. It's one that I don't see a clear answer to. And that could be frustrating, of course. It's much easier to go in and go, I've got the answers, this is what we need to do. But of course, that doesn't make for a very um, much analysis or, or, or much to do um, in, a, in, a, uh, in a submission or, a, or an assessment item for that matter. It is the tricky ones where we actually are put to task to actually... Um, be creative and innovative and have a look at the problem from different angles where we can actually really show what we can do as researchers and as lawyers. So, okay, uh, hopefully I've convinced you that this is, a, this is a, a really good project for us to be working on. If not, um, it's unfortunately it's the only one we have a choice of. Um, but I, honestly, I don't think anyone should, should really have a problem with this. Now, in terms of the document, make sure you get yourself a copy of the document straight away. It's been uploaded to perusal, um, and this time I think I have managed to click the download um, button that I was supposed to do. Hopefully I did that correctly, um, to allow you to download it for yourself, but also you can make as usual comments on the document itself. So it's 80 odd pages. Um, it's reasonably short for a law reform issues paper, which is nice, uh, quite manageable and quite containable. Um, the, the key part of it really to start to start with is a list of questions. Now this one actually puts them right at the start of the paper and these are the questions that the issues paper is raising and asking for public comment on. 
and these questions are also then distributed throughout the text in each section. Each section ends with a series of numbered questions. Now this is very crucial to the law reform process and the way we work through issues papers and, and the way that when if you work for a body such as the, this institute you are then uh, and you assemble your final report you can actually use that structure to go through in a methodical way and to make sure that you've covered all the public responses, all the research that's been done, and make sure that each part of the section is covered before the, the institute or commission then makes a recommendation on each of those. So they're asked as questions, and when we come to the final report, they'll be answered as, as, as recommendations. What should we do about this? Recommendation is that we should do that. And this is where public submissions come very become very important, not just to gather um, public opinion on, on a particular issue, but also to crowdsource research because these bodies don't have very much money, they don't have a lot of resources, and it actually is very useful for them to have informed and skilled people in the public out there researching and giving them additional information, which is what, which, what we'll be doing. So make sure you have a look at the document, we'll, be, we'll get onto it in the first few weeks, and we'll be working through it throughout the term and actually having a look at examples of how the different research techniques and methodologies apply in this particular context. Um, now, at some point um, around week four, we'll be dividing into groups. Um, I'm not worrying about it before that date because we have a lot of people that generally pull out at, um, not a lot of people, we have some people generally pull out at census date for various reasons. And if I've never said it to you before, I'll, I do recommend um, if you do think you're gonna struggle in a term, pulling out of at least a couple of your subjects before census date because then you don't end up with a, a, a blot on your record or the debt for that particular subject. So it is a good idea if you think, oh boy, I've overcommitted here, I've got four subjects, um, before that census date comes around to, to make sure you, you think very carefully about what you can do. But as a result, it means if I were to divide, if, if we were to divide into groups now, then, then some of us won't be there by the time the work needs to be done. So we won't do that just yet. And we don't need to do it for the first assessment item either. The first set a series of tasks in the assessment item are really couched in terms of the overall project of the law reform project and are very kind of general. That doesn't mean that you can't start thinking about specific parts of the issues paper now and start thinking about, you know what I'd really like to do? Question 13 and question 14. I think they're really interesting. It's fine to do that. There'll be a process of negotiation along the way once the groups are formed, um, but it is, it is perfectly fine for you to start having a strong opinion now. Um, so that when the groups come about, you can, you can say, look, I've got dibs on this one and to see whether anyone else wants to do that as well. And then, then you'll have to have a, a, a resolution process in there. Now the groups will be around somewhere between eight and 12 people. Lots of reasons for that. Um, but this is about the right size for a research team, particularly a university one, where you'll probably find there'll be a couple of people in the team who might disappear along the way, unfortunately. And they'll do that after the census date and they'll run up a terrible hex debt um, along the way. But it does often happen. Also, we realize that 12 is about the maximum size of a group of people that can actually make decisions. Um, which is interesting because that's the size of a jury. Um, not sure what's magic about the number 12, but studies of corporations have shown that if you have large uh, boards of directors, they, they can't make decisions. It seems to be somewhere in that magic number between 8 and 12, which is the effective number of people who can actually do something as a team. Now, what that means for this particular um, research um, issues paper is there are 26 questions. That so means roughly two questions each. Now, I'm not going to be prescriptive at this point because not all questions are equal, and there may be a, a, a need for a little bit of massaging of, of maybe someone will do three and someone will only do one. But roughly speaking, everyone in a group will do two questions. And one of the nice things about um, public inquiries is that you're not required to answer every single question. You can, you, can, you can answer just the questions you want to. What that means is you are not left in a position as a student where someone drops out or doesn't pull their weight or whatever, and you've got gaps in your final report. Not a problem because all of your reports in terms of assessment sit individually 
So yes, you're working in a team, you're sharing information, um, you're working in a way that's consistent in that team, but it's really about your work and your research. And if your team, and it's, this is not going to happen, but if your team was absolutely dysfunctional and at the end of the day you were the only one who was actually working and you just put your own work in, that wouldn't be a problem. That wouldn't stop you being a, a, an HD star achiever. And again, this is one of the reasons why I think the law reform format is great because in a in a normal kind of essay assignment, that would be lethal having it, having some people drop out part way through. But here it doesn't matter because each of those questions are considered separately. So in terms of the process itself, we'll talk about more of the technicalities in the first few weeks. Um, but I'm quite happy for people to start forming their own groups, and um, some already have actually because people are extremely keen. They've let me know they want to be in groups together. Now that's fine, and I will work with that. But there will be a point at which I start. Um, constructing groups and if you have a group of five and a group of nine and a group of two uh, a group of five a group of four and a group of two um, I may put those groups together under one umbrella likewise if people aren't in any groups I'll start constructing groups out of those that are, that are left over at some point as well so um, I guess the message is if you don't mind that if you're happy just to go with the flow um, somewhere after week four, you will be told this is the team you're in and this is notionally the questions you're going to look at. Um, but if you want to be proactive, there's nothing stopping you starting to put that group together now and certainly nothing stopping you starting to plan about, you know what, I think I really want to do these questions and that questions. What do you think? What does everyone else in that group think? All right. And we'll be talking about technological platforms for collaboration um, a little later as well. Um, and that's something that we talk about in this course because increasingly the research world is, is distributed. You're not sitting in the same room as the people or necessarily in the same country as the people you're doing research with. So one of the things we learn about this term is, is different online sharing platforms that we can use to try and streamline those processes and enable um, collaboration. All right, I have been talking for quite some time, um, but at this point I just want to say that um, don't don't stress or obsess about the group um, process. Uh, I totally appreciate that many of you have been burned in the past by university assignments where you get plonked into a group of seven strangers and told, go on and do something as a cohesive whole and you'll be penalised if anyone doesn't pull their weight. Uh, we've all been there, we've all had bad experiences, but in this environment we're using teamwork is something that is a strength as, as a collaboration not as a weakness alrighty so I guess um, we'll talk about this more but I want to leave you with a couple of things to think about a couple of questions to ponder okay here's one how important is, is the pragmatic costs of justice and I mean the financial economic costs um, particularly in situations where we know incarceration may not be a solution that actually has any long-term effect. It may incapacitate a person from committing crime, or at least crime against the general public while they're in prison. But we don't. We we know from statistics that incarceration is not going to stop them committing crimes in the future. So, at what point do we balance, on the one hand, this idea of right and wrong and justice being about the correct answer, and the other hand, the idea of managing justice? which is based on resources and finite resources where you've got to figure out where can you spend money most effectively. So that's, okay, that's a very vague question. It's a very multi-parted question, but think about it this way. Where, where is that balance between the money and the justice? Where, 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 where can, how do we determine that? The second question, um, how does the concept of addiction challenge our ideas of intentionality? And those ideas, I guess, about um, criminal responsibility. Because our model of, of crime is really based on this idea of people intentionally doing wrong. What does, what does what we know about addiction mean for that? How does that change that? I mean, beyond just saying, well, it's no excuse. But that's not what we're asking. We're thinking about if, if a crime, we have to form an intention to commit a particular crime, then where does addiction actually lie there? 
Um, and what flows onto that is that then, you know, why do some some criminal offences then lack a mental element? They lack that um, mens rea as an element. And all you have to look at is the result of what someone did, whether they intended it or not. So that's something to think about, you know, intention, addiction, criminal responsibility. And third question, final one, is whose responsibility are these sorts of problems? Um, now, hopefully we live in a society where we have a multi-agency approach, where everyone tries to pull together and not play politics too much in solving these kinds of problems. But there is a fundamental question here about, you know, is this a legal problem? Is this a criminal justice problem? Is this a health problem? Is this a technology problem? You know, if we have self-driving cars in the near future, are drink drivers going to be a problem at all? Is that going to get rid of the problem of drink drivers if we stop having people driving cars at all? If we do that, what are the costs? What is the absolute, what, what's the cost of saying, well, no one's allowed to drive a car anymore? Um, we're going to have the, the, um, the computers driving the cars instead. So ultimately, like many wicked problems, these things are multifaceted. And it's not a matter of being able to just simply go, look, this is, this is the agency that should have fixed it. This is what they need to do to fix it. It'll be done because if that was just, if it was that simple, it would have been done ages ago. So all of our solutions then are vested in this kind of idea of not only can we try and find out the right solution or a solution that, that takes us a little bit closer to perfection, but also then how do we mobilize these different agencies to work together? How do we make sure that everyone's on the same page and cooperating and collaborating? Anyway, that's been a, a bit of a, a sprawling look at the topic. Um, I hope I'm pretty excited by it as something that we're going to look at this term. Hope you're, you're enthused for it as well. And um, I will see you in the first tutorials.